Good morning. Welcome. Week three, regathering. Glad to have you here this morning for the nine o'clock service. We come together to worship today, and the Word of God comes into our lives in many ways. God's Word comes to us, calling us to action, calling us to new life. God's Word calls to us now, here, even in our worship. God's calling Word invites us to service, to ministry in His name, to praise, and to give thanksgiving. And we're going to worship now the living God and offer our praises to the Eternal One. Would you rise to your feet? We're going to ask you to stand and sing with your masks on. I know that's a little difficult, but if you would, we're going to praise to the Lord Most High. From the ends of the earth, the depths of the sea, the heights of the heavens, your name be praised from the hearts of the weak, from the hearts of the weak, from the shouts of the strong, from the, shouts of the, strong. From the lips of all people, this song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord. Exalted in every nation, sovereign of all creation, Lord most high, be magnified. The ends of the earth, the depths of the sea, the depths of the sea, the heights of the heavens. Your name be praised from the hearts of the weak, from the, hearts of the, weak. the shouts of the strong, from the, shouts of the, strong. From the lips of all people, the song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high. Sovereign of the creation, Lord, most high, be Declaring the 
that we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. seated. Our scripture for this morning, we continue looking in 1 John and we go into the fourth chapter today looking at the first six verses together. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God, that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God, well, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, though, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world. The world listens to them, but we are from God. And he who knows God listens to us, and he who is not from God does not listen to us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We give thanks to God for his word this morning as we come to worship him. We want to now join together in prayer, so if you would bow with me. Reconciling Savior and Lord in a world where many are friendless, we thank you for your constant companionship to remind us we are not alone. In situations of violence and, and hatred and bitterness, thank you, Lord, for your commandment to love one another, and that if we love you and we love one another, then you will be revealed. Heavenly Father, in times where many know death and destruction, thank you for living in the season of resurrection despite the despair that surrounds us. So as you love us, Lord, make us faithful friends who love one another by proclaiming the good news of the resurrection to all people. For we ask this in your presence, in your holy name. Amen. We want to continue to worship this morning to praise to the cornerstone of our faith. And if you would like, please stand and join us as we sing together. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong, and the Savior's love. on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within
come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone. as God's people and we wish to come together in prayer together in prayer for one another in prayer for others so I invite you if you would to to prayerfully join me now in a responsive time of intercessory prayer you will see your part on the screen when it comes up which is hear our prayer O Lord let the people of God pray together God of grace and mercy be present with us as we face an unknown future and as we walk paths untrodden. Hear our prayer, O Lord. In the ever-changing and uncertain world where we find ourselves, help us to know and be assured that you are sovereign, that you are all-knowing, all-powerful, and ever-present. We know you are a good God who holds us in our anxiety and distress and who has a plan for our future. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Calm our hearts and minds and give us hope in you, our only certain hope. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Breathe new life into my wings. 
We continue to look at this word from John in 1 John chapter 4. You know, it's not always easy to know the truth, is it? I mean, immediately you and I think of hashtag fake news. <laughs> or which source of information do you rely upon? Or how can you tell who is telling the truth after hearing so many things? Well, the truth is, this is nothing new. It really isn't. John tells the believers that they need to test the truth. That if you are a Christ follower, you must always be looking to test what is true. Even back then, it was important to not jump upon something until we would let God's Spirit help us 
discern that lost word in the English vocabulary, discern what was right or what was wrong, what was true or what was false. I mean, how do we decide, though, with competing voices all around us? Well, that's exactly what this part of the text is telling us today. If there is something that I see perhaps lost in generations coming after mine, my grouping, it is that what we've lost in today's world is we have not delved into any longer the discipline of critical thinking. We have so standardized our educational processes by bureaucrats usually, and even our work experience, we have lost the important skill that is perhaps the most necessary skill that needs developing in any person's life on every strata of living. How to analyze and critically examine the world around us. How to give it a testing within our minds, our hearts, and our souls. And all that leads to the question from Scripture today, who is speaking the truth? It's testing time. Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Because you know there's a lot of false prophets that have gone out into the world. Now, stopping here for just a moment, as we've talked about over the weeks, this letter is written, or this, uh, it's almost more sermon than the typical epistle letter. Uh, and I can almost imagine that he is standing there uh, in front of the ones who are left within the church and you know, thinking about the ones who left that church to follow some new type of doctrine and, and new type of belief that really didn't you know, stand up to the test of the Holy Spirit and of, the, of what had been given them. And I can almost imagine at this point that, that John is sitting there with the window open. And he's not saying, Beloved, don't believe every spirit. spirit but he's, he's saying, Beloved, don't believe every spirit. But test the spirits, <laughs> he yells out, whether they're from God or not, because there's a lot of false prophets out there. Make that window even higher. False prophets everywhere. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now we've talked last week and, and before about this is, there, there was a, a movement in the late part of the first century within the church where there were some people who tried to deny that Jesus was God in flesh. It's a weird kind of thought and system, and it kind of, it, it, it's really Greek influence. But nonetheless, that, was, that very well may be the problem that's going on here. So he emphasized again, if you don't believe Jesus is flesh come from God, and every, then every spirit that doesn't confess that is a spirit of antichrist or opposite Christ or, or the other Christ, of which you've heard is coming. I've talked to you about it. It's already here with us in the world. In the ancient world, this phrase was perfectly adapting to life as much as it does today. Where was the truth in the activities of this world? What was God saying when many are giving competing lessons and voices and alluring things? You know, one of the problems that, that happened for many in the early church was that they were coming from a culture that had no understanding of Yahweh God, or maybe they heard a little bit from some Jewish people that were in the city, but they were more used to the pantheon of gods that the Greeks, who then the Romans gave their Roman names to them, that the Greeks had developed as systematic kind of way to explain everything. And, and, and they also did it appealing-wise with certain religious practices that they were a part of. But here they are immersed in a culture with, with this different number of gods, with different distractions, with um, hopeful opulence. And does any of that sound familiar? I'm believing the truth of there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. It is not an accident that the phrase to go out that is used here, John is speaking to that group who, 
who left the true community of faith, the true understanding of faith, and compromised it to the world so they could do what they wanted and be what they wanted. And they're evidently led by the false prophets. And now a lot of people claim to speak for God or claim to speak for his, that have the spirit, but they deceive and mislead people, John says. But there's an application to the world within this admonition. We live in an age when such things are extremely prevalent. I read a lot of notices on social media that too often times have their basis in half of a truth, but not the whole truth. And sometimes, sometimes they're just plain old lies and not truth at all. And they're posted by good people who I think the world of. But it wouldn't take much to print all the truth to get a point across. It's devastatingly true when it comes to faith and what we truly believe. You know, I, I, I give you an example. There was a post from a, a particular person uh, this week that, that kind of disturbed me considering how my week has gone, uh, that, you know, was talking about this is a, this is a screenshot from the CDC, and it shows, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that the COVID virus is just the same as a, as a cold virus, and, and can be te- the test could be, be cold even though it's not identified COVID. And I went and looked from the CDC guideline, and they had snapshotted a piece off of the guideline on the CDC that was about antibody tests. It was not about the test of detection of the virus strain of COVID-19. You see, we have to be understanding that putting something out like that, we can say, I was mistaken, and I can reply very nicely, you were lazy. We could say, well, I don't know what to believe anymore. I can say, dig for it. That's why God gave us the thought and reason. Sometimes the lie is just the manipulation of what is to what I want it to be. We've lost that ability to think critically in this culture. We've lost the desire to search for and discover the truth. We settle for any kernel of thought that comes our way, any piece of wisdom that passes our screen or our eyes that happens to agree with what we believe already. John is telling the church, you can't be like that. That's what the world does. God's people are about the truth. Then he continues, you are from God, little children. Which, he always backs back up to something positive. You are you're from God, little children. He's, he's not yelling out the window anymore. He's looking back at them. And you have overcome them. Why? How? Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. He's reminding them as difficult as they may be, or the Antichrist might be, or, or the devil who owns this world. It is nothing because Christ is within you. So therefore, he says, speak as, uh, you know, we are, that we are from God. He, he says, you know, the world people, they're going to speak like the world speaks. They're going to listen to what the world has to say. But we are from God, and he who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God doesn't listen. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. God is greater than this world. Heard it all my life. Believed it, for it seems like, all of my life. But do I believe it? I mean, do you believe that? Or do I act, or do I live as if that is debatable? Hmm. How do you respond in the darkest times? There was a movie some years ago starring Nicole Kidman, and uh, Jude Law, that interesting actor. Uh, but, but it was called Cold Mountain. It was delving in the time of the Civil War. And uh, there was one scene that always got to me. Ruby was a character who came uh, to the farm uh, after uh, 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 Nicole Kidman's character, had uh, her dad had died, and she was left alone. And Ruby is there with her and teaching her how to farm, teaching her how to cultivate the farm they've got, how to do things, and then... Uh, there is this horrific scene when the home guard, that's the ones who went to make sure everybody went to serve the South but didn't themselves, you know, instead stayed home and kept their peace and their plunder. And anyway, they, they had come, they had killed ruthlessly 
uh, this friend of theirs, her, her husband, her sons, and they had left her tied up against a rail fence with the rails laying on her hands, and it was, it was a vicious, vicious thing. But I will never forget as they're trying to free their friend up from those rails, and as they're sitting there, Ruby in her simple mind and simple ways begins to cry out, this world won't last long, it won't stand long. God won't let it. He won't let it stand this, this way long. No. And, and I thought about what she was saying. And what she was saying is that she believed that God will be the last word. God will be the last word. And that's how we are to respond, John is telling us. John is reminding believers we trust in God despite the news. And despite the spirits that would try to tell us differently. The notion of panic and confusion reign today even, even within the thoughts of... the in the words of the church. We who claim to be believers and Christ followers must return to the root truth that God will reveal to us what is true and what is necessary if we will patiently and diligently wait and take the time to discern. The tests rely on whether it is from God or from the world. That's how you interpret John is saying, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, of probably the greatest Baptist statement I can ever recall. 1963, Southern Baptist Convention adopted what was then the Baptist faith and message for 1963. Herschel Hobbes was the main architect of that. And uh, Herschel Hobbes had the best phrase I ever saw under Scripture. He talked about Scripture and how do you discern Scripture, how do you interpret Scripture, and he said very plainly, and I think very powerfully that we interpret God's will and the scriptures through the personhood of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the lens that will help us to see clearly what God has in mind for us. Our own church still holds to that faith and that, that confession of faith, if you will. Why? Because that's the test. That's the very test, in the sense, of John here. In John's gospel, origins matter, where something comes from is important. So he says here in his, in his word to this church that, you know, it's important that you believe that what you believe is coming from God and not from this world. Brian Harbour, who was longtime pastor uh, in Arkansas, in a sermon entitled, Test the Spirits, warned against the spirits of the self, that is, as the center of our lives, the spirit of sensuality, pleasure is the primary purpose for my living, and the spirit of secularism, in which he said money and things that money can buy, not the way that word has been used in other terms. He described the danger of the spirit of the self. He said, we live in an era of narcissism. Now, he wrote that about 30 years ago, and I'm not so sure he's, he's, he's you know, missed the boat anywhere. You know, where narcissism is we are the center of the universe. It revolves around me. Yeah, and those of you who have raised kids know <laughs> that it can revolve around me. Walt Whitman once said, the whole theory of the universe is unfortunately directed unerringly to one single individual, namely to you. It is one thing to believe in God's worth that he holds for you, but it is much too often that we take that to the extreme. Back to social media again. I saw an individual's post, and I didn't know them. It was just one of those memes that they throw out there who said they refused a mask because her faith told her that God had already appointed her time to die, and if she were to die by this virus, then it wouldn't matter if she had a mask or not. Well, that's a nice Calvinistic thought. Yeah. And, and maybe it makes you feel better. I don't know. But when I thought about that, I also thought, of what Jesus said to the tempter in the wilderness, in the desert. After being tempted, he looked at the tempter and said, it also says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God, or test the Lord your God. You, know, you see where I'm coming from. What she was saying was a distortion of what Jesus would say to us. Frederick, the, and, and, the, and the guy is out there. I mean, the, Lucifer is a great name. 
Why? Because it's tempting. You know, I mean, if they called him, you know, the old hag or something like that, I mean, nobody would follow that. But, yeah, they, 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 he's given this wonderful name because we forget how cunning the enemy is. Beekner wrote about Lucifer. He said, Lucifer was no longer called upon to love anybody when he fell except himself. He no longer could sing Bach anywhere but in the bathtub by himself. <laughs> or to follow anything or anybody except his own instincts and inclinations. He was given an office with mottos on the wall like, nobody loves you like yourself, and nice guys finish last on the, uh, on the sampler beside him. He was named number one in charge of everybody else who both then and for all time felt the same exact way as he did. And Beekner said, and, they've been, and those people and he have been having a devil of a time together ever since. <laughs> we are tempted by the voices. When examining the truths that are thrown at us and around us, how do we recognize? We look for the voice of God rather than the voice of man. In John's Gospel, in the 10th chapter, Jesus tells this wonderful story in description of the good shepherd. And of course the illusion is that he is the good shepherd. And he tells us that, that the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. But you know, the truth of that is the sheep had to learn the voice. Just like if you had a pet at home, they have to learn your voice. They have to learn your happy voice and your really mad and angry voice. <laughs> and they know the difference. Don't think they don't. But the sheep had to learn it. And they didn't learn it overnight. They had to learn it through days and through weeks and, and months of having the shepherd speak towards them and to them. And eventually, they began to recognize the voice that was called. The reason for that is pretty obvious. That story, that, Je that illustration of Jesus is there because we spend a lifetime working on hearing the real voice of God. Well, what is that like? There's a, an old Pontius Puddle cartoon that began with, I wonder if God can really hear me. The next frame showed Pontius praying, Hey God, what should I do with my life? In the next frame, there was a voice from heaven. You know how those are drawn in a cartoon saying, Feed the hungry. Write injustice. Work for peace. And in the next frame, Pontius says, just testing. And then the last frame, God speaks back and says, same here, buddy. Same here. We only recognize his voice by spending time with him. We, too, are invited to be incarnational in our faith as Christians. Jesus came in flesh, John tells us. That's how we know. And because he came in flesh, we have the opportunity to hear his voice and, and recognize his voice because he got in the pool with us. There's a story I read about uh, a gentleman told about his family's vacations and several of the younger children were playing in the pool. And meanwhile, you know, he, the grandfather, patrolled the sidelines, checking, you know, checking on their well-being. Is anybody in deep water? Is anybody in trouble? But that didn't work because it wasn't long until they all yelled, you know, for granddaddy, get in the pool, get in the pool with us. And when he got in the pool with them, they felt better. And he felt better. Because he was now swimming with them in the midst of what they were going through. They were in, he was incarnational with his grandchildren. And God is that through Jesus with us. We may get engaged in congregational life, even work towards a community that valued others, but we only do it by getting in the pool. And you get in the pool sometimes in the simplest of ways, uh, picking up a phone call and listening. Picking up a phone and calling someone to listen to them. Handing out a meal. Helpful connections to job opportunities that you know of and that they're looking for. It's simple stuff. Speaking out for what is right. <coughs> Eric Rust was a great... Uh, theology teacher at Southern Seminary in my day and died back uh, around early 90s. 
He wrote in Christ, the whole universe and the whole of humanity are summed up in one human life. And the creative energies of man and his world are redirected once more by that life. Here, man is not, he said, only shown how he should live as God's partner, but is also lifted from estrangement back into the divine fellowship, given the spiritual dynamic to fulfill his destiny. And what that means is Jesus has come to where we are. He is there in fellowship with us. and He will lead us to follow the voice of now more than ever, it's time to listen, time to discern, to focus on what we are believing and what we are saying, listening to. It is test time. And this test will determine if our life is really going in the direction of Christ. Or is it, unfortunately, through deception, following the direction of the world? It's time for testing the spirits. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, none of us likes tests. But they're an important part of this life that you have created here in us. It's not a test, Lord, to, to say, aha, I tricked you. Lord, you don't ask us who's buried in General Grant's tomb. You ask us, oh Lord, will you listen to my voice? If the voice you hear reflects what you have seen through Scripture and through the Holy Spirit, then you are following the voice of the shepherd, the voice of God. So, Lord, step by step, may we do the work. Better yet, Lord, may we let you work on us to be faithfully truthful. in our discipleship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. as we leave here, I'm going to ask if you'll patiently wait for our ushers as they will come by row, by pew, and ask if you can leave through the front doors would be the best option. And if not, we will be glad to let you come in this direction. Now go from here. Test what you hear, what you see, what you know and what you believe. And listen for the voice of the shepherd who will take you and discern for you the truth of God's love, grace, and mercy. Amen. Ushers, if you will.